thank you uh, for joining us this afternoon where it's House Human Services and House Healthcare are doing a joint hearing on um, um, something that came to us through the budget. And at the time, we didn't really have all the information um, for us to make a decision. So we thought it best for the two committees to come together. So it's psychiatric residential treatment facility. We have a long list of people who are going to explain to us what this facility is proposed for. Um, we're going to have an hour and a half. And then I do believe human services will be leaving. Healthcare will stay. And if we need more time, we'll have another 30 minutes. And then healthcare will break, but then stay in this room for our, for our next topic. So any questions? Um, no. Um, we did not have this in human services on our um, budget, in our budget area, um, but it definitely impacts children and youth that we have responsibility for, uh, both those in DCF custody, as well as those served through the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living. So um, uh, we're happy to be here with um, the House Health Care Committee and to have an opportunity to hear more about um, sort of, uh, what I guess I would call, what I'm hoping to hear is about uh, sort of the overall larger plan. Um, uh, Cause uh, yeah, we're, we're seeing little bits and pieces of it, um, but uh, need something that looks um, broadly. So yeah. thank you. A vision. Yeah. What is the vision? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna start with Monica. <clears throat> Yeah, I know it seems far away <laughs> <laughs> because it is. Can I bring a friend? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> Hopefully, there's some extra chairs down there. Sure. Sure. Oh, that's all right. You can make do over here. Okay. Oh, I know. I know. Here we go. Wrangle me. Great. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Monica Ogilby. I am the Medicaid Director in the Agency of Human Services in the Central Office. Um, this is my first time providing testimony in this new role, and so if it's okay, I wanted to take just a moment to introduce myself since I am a new face. Um, I'm a pediatric nurse by training. I specialized when I was in practice in intensive care and in palliative care, and so Perhaps on some of you in other spaces when I have provided testimony on things um, related to children and youth with special health needs, I was the director of that program at the health department for about eight years. Um, and then took a path supporting the immunization efforts during the pandemic and found my way here. Um, this, I feel very fortunate to get to be providing testimony on this topic because it is a space in which I have provided uh, focused a lot of my professional and personal interests in a long time, particularly around children need the special health needs. And um, over the, the course of the nine months working here, I've also realized that not only is this a topic area that I feel incredibly passionately about, but uh, part of the reason I took the role of the Medicaid director was to provide more continuity and collaboration across our entire agency, where we have Medicaid programming, policy, finance, touching the work that we do, and this is an exemplary example of where we're seeing a confluence of challenges and needs across all of our departments that are impacting not just the children and the youth that we're talking about, but also their, their caregivers. And uh, we shouldn't lose sight of the ecosystem that is trying to wrap around these kids and their families and is truly unable to do so because of the lack of resources. So uh, I am very, very happy to be here today. And I will also just take a moment to explain that the Medicaid director role has always existed. Um, it's generally been held by the DIVA commissioner or the DIVA uh, deputy commissioner. But as you can imagine, that is a big job to have in addition to sort of checking the proverbial box of being a Medicaid director as well. So. Um, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to be in this role in the secretary's office, work across all of our departments, including the agency of education, where we have quite a bit of Medicaid uh, programming happening as well, and to really try to start bringing some of these pieces together. So when you asked about what is the vision, um, that is a question that I'm also asking and that we're really starting to contemplate together. And uh, I hope that this effort that has been going on for months 
across the agency is going to be a real framework for how we move forward when we're identifying initiatives and projects that need to be uh, elevated and amplified because they impact all of our departments. Um, so thank you very much for having me. I uh, invite any of you to reach out anytime. It's really lovely to get to know all of you and thank you. So um, I'm not the content expert. I will open by saying that I am really a supporter, a convener um, and uh, cannot take very much credit for the work that you're gonna see here today. Uh, that has by and large been the work of the departments who have done an incredible job, Cheryl Wilcox uh, in particular. Um, would it be helpful to have Cheryl introduce herself before I go any further? I just realized that. Right, thanks. <laughs> uh, for the record, Cheryl Wilcox, I'm the Director of Mental Health Collaborations at the Department of Mental Health, which means um, that I am lucky in my role to be able to work across our departments at the Agency of Human Services. So projects that I am a part of um, and that I lead have many team members and uh, the recognition that there are a lot of us here today is because it has taken a lot of us to reach this point. And so I hope that we can set the table of how, especially the psychiatric residential treatment facility fits in to a bigger picture that is very on the forefront of our minds. And we have spent um, a lot of years looking at our system of care and communities and what we need for programming for youth and children, especially with complex needs um, and so that is uh, what we're going to convey today. A background, um, I haven't testified in front of any of you. Um, I'm a social worker, so um, I went to college in Vermont, got my social work degree, worked with teenagers, um, also worked in child protection, juvenile justice, um, as a foster parent for teenagers. It's an age group I love and care deeply about, and so this project and the work in particular is something that is very close to my passion um, and what I care about. And so it has been quite a journey for us to get here and we will be able to talk about how we arrived at this data we looked at and decision-making on the way. So thank you for having me. We got some great information from many of you talking to many of us. So we tried to culminate a lot of that and put it in some succinct slides that are something for you to digest probably after this conversation, uh, but we'll use them as a, as a guide and um, I'll kick us off and then you're gonna hear from each one of the individual departments as well. Um, oh, get that. Okay. <laughs> um, so is it okay if I use the acronym PRTF while we talk today? Great. Um, so what is the problem we're trying to solve? Um, this is something a PRTF is, is a resource that does not exist in Vermont. Mind you, we are accessing PRTF services out of state. We are paying for them out of state, but we don't have them in Vermont. Uh, thus, we are moving these already vulnerable youth and kids out of state further away from their local system of care and supports, making it, as you can imagine, incredibly challenging for the people that are hoping to support them when they are hopefully back home soon uh, incredibly difficult, sometimes impossible. Um, and so what this means is that our system of care is experiencing kids that are getting stuck in all sorts of places where they don't need to be. A lower, lower level of care where they're unable to be supported adequately and safely, or a much higher level of care where they definitely don't need to be and it's hard to provide appropriate services when they're in a higher level of care than necessary. And the bottom line here is that the landscape has changed. And I think that's something very important for us to think about when we talk about visioning, that is something that's gonna be in the forefront of our planning. The needs of these children and youth are far more acute and complex than our community-based system can support them, regardless of funding. And that is a really important thing for us to think about. This discussion is not just about a PRTF either, um, or a PRTF instead of community supports. Both are valuable. Oh, I'm just chuckling because there isn't any way that anybody's going to be able to read that. You, you are welcome to put up like a picture of a nice dog right now or something because he will not read this to you. I um, do, so do we have these on our website? Yeah, yeah. You, yes. yes. Okay. okay, got all of them. Um, 
we'll discuss this content later. Uh, this discussion is about a PRTF versus home and community-based services. This is about a continuum of care. This is about a system. This is about an ecosystem around children and youth in need. Um, but the bottom line is that we have one of these parts of this system. We have home and community-based services and supports. And yes, they need more uh, support and resources, but we actually do not have this in Vermont. This is a, a pretty gaping hole. Um, and unfortunately, our community supports and community home and community-based services are, are on life support right now because the system itself doesn't have access to these services, never mind the kids themselves don't. So as a result, not only are the children and youth struggling, but we're also seeing the impact this is having on the workforce and our designated agencies and in our SSA partners. These agencies have worked tirelessly, and I know you know this, to recruit and retain staff to improve the wellness culture within their organizations to recover from the catastrophic impacts of the pandemic. And by expecting them to care for children in the community that they cannot appropriately do so, um, in a safe way is leading to increased burnout and turnover in their staff. So this uh, PRTF not only has an impact on the children and youth that we intend to serve, but also on the system of care that is desperately trying to stay afloat. Um, this is really about right sizing needs and care. Uh, the establishment of a PRTF is as therapeutic for the children that it serves as it is the workforce around us and uh, preserving our uh, system. The identification of a PRTF as a necessary resource needed here in Vermont uh, has been the product of well over a year of collaboration across agency of human services. Mm -hmm. This is not something that we just came up with and said, hey, that sounds like a good idea. This has been a very acutely identified need um, through lots of collaboration and data calling and pouring over information. Um, and this has also been uh, proposed in collaboration with our DAs and our SSAs. And it's a really wonderful thing when not only all of the departments can come together and agree on a, a pathway forward, but also our DA and SSA partners who are critically important in this discussion. Um, and, you know, when we pause and we think about this and we think about other places where we're really trying to bring Vermonters home, um, it, I can't help but mention that this doesn't feel entirely dissimilar to the work that we're doing to bring home incarcerated Vermonters. And um, it, it feels like if we're really prioritizing that in other populations, then we should also be considering prioritizing that in these incredibly vulnerable youth and children. Monica, mm -hmm. um, I just want to check in. We should have done this with all the witnesses. When do you want to take questions or if people have questions for clarification, like at the end, I don't know. I know that we have a, a you know, quite a few witnesses. Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure that we have an opportunity for members to ask questions, but I don't want to interrupt like I just did, but. <laughs> and I'm glad you did. I am really open to interruption. And if it's okay with members, what perhaps what, you know, if we know that that's a question that will be addressed later on by a, a different member of our team, then we can just say, We'll address that shortly. Okay. Okay. I'll pause here though, because then I'm going to turn it over to my friend. Okay. Sharon. That that might be good if you um yep. you know if the presenters can pause at, at specific points to ask questions. So yeah, of course. Uh, I have one. So when I when I look at the definition of the PRTF, one thing that seems missing to me is um psychology. Um and it is focusing heavily on uh, mental health and psychiatry, but I also know that we're looking at children and youth with developmental disabilities. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering about the, um, uh, I guess the cadre of staff who, will, who would be at this facility. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's a great question and it's, um, I would say the title doesn't really share kind of the full scope of what they would provide as treatment. So it is made up of nursing, psychiatry, social workers, um, other folks that provide mental health services. So it, it runs across that. And we certainly have more detail about all the staffing that is needed for a PRTF because it's fairly extensive. So um, I, I guess because what um, what AHS is proposing here is to serve, I guess, a, what I would say is a, a variety of youth with a variety of different needs. Um, how will we be assured that 
those different needs will be accommodated. Um, you know, I'm thinking about, uh, I see educational, I, so I, I can see that um, the conversation that I had with Jennifer has been reflected. Um, I asked her, what about education? I know we have, we get reports of youth um, right now with disabilities getting two hours a week, not a day, a week. Um, and I don't know exactly how that can be considered educational services. So um, I guess uh, we would want to ensure that the developmental disability needs of youth um, are being addressed uh, at, at uh, their stay there as well. And that's, you know, um, you know, learning different, sometimes it's about communication. Um, sometimes it's about trying to figure out how to communicate their needs. Um, uh, so I just um, want to assure that um, this is a, going to be a program um, that is going to be able to address the divergent needs of a variety of youth, which I'll be honest, I think is a big challenge. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I said it's important for all of us to put our biases out on the table. I have a bias against facility based services for children and youth. I'm just putting that out there as my personal bias. Um, so I, I am definitely going to want to assure that um, youth, particularly those um, in our committee's jurisdiction, um, have their needs met in uh, ways that are not uh, going to traumatize them. Um, in any way further than they might already have been traumatized. Yeah, and I'm I'm very glad you said that um, because you know I think what we're trying to achieve here is something where the children and youth are the common denominator, and it's not about if they're you know part of the mental health pathway or the Dale pathway or whatever the pathway is. Um, what we're trying to achieve here is an opportunity for kids to be cared in a multidisciplinary way by a multidisciplinary team that is going to be able to meet their needs in a flexible way as, as things change. Um, because what we're seeing is that our system has been built. And I say this, you know, with, I know that it was built with best of intentions, but it's built in a silo and oh, these kids don't function in a silo. They need a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a lot of this and a lot more of that and things might change and they need more of this. And so in order for us to actually make something effective, we have to have that multidisciplinary team there on site to meet their needs when they need them to be met, not in six months. So, um, you know, when they can get through a referral. So I, I think that's really what we're trying to achieve here um, is not thinking of kids as falling into any one bucket or category, but really identifying them as what their needs are and what they need in order to succeed and hopefully come back to the community and be cared within the designated agency or, you know, through another community-based support. I think I also would add, I appreciate your point about having youth be there who are right for the place and having the supports and services. So this is a 15, like one five bed program, which means it is not for every youth. And that's part of the referral process. It's part of the assessment of, is a, a youth appropriate for this? So if we are looking at a youth with a severe developmental disability who is nonverbal or has significant um, areas that they need special support, this probably will not be the place for them. We don't think this is going to answer every, so it's not going to be the solution for every child and youth. And so it's part of why we've also been doing this across our multiple departments. So we can think about that. And we, it's part of the work we're doing on a contract to say, like, here's what we think is appropriate. Here's what can be. Um, because we also need to think of the mix of youth that we have together in this program. Um, and I would say as someone from mental health, not from developmental disabilities, I also have, when I think about residential or group care, it has been something that I've struggled with. Like, how do we do that? Is it, is it the best thing? And there was someone actually, a colleague of mine who years ago said, you know, I hear you. And this also, when we have it, done the right way with the right youth together, they also get peers, they have belonging. They're with other youth who are struggling, who can support each other. And for me, that was a huge pivot point for me in thinking like we, we only want this for youth that need it at the time they need it. And it for a PRTF, there has to be a, a mental health challenge. So they also could have a developmental disability. They also might be struggling with substances, but 
it's, it's because of medical necessity of having a mental health challenge that makes it appropriate for them to be there. It's very highly regulated in that way. Um, so I think that's an, another piece of this as well that we've been looking at. I think, um, I think I've, I've asked this question a couple times and I'm still not quite sure of the answer and I'm looking ahead at your slides and I'm not sure if that's gonna answer me. Can you, can you sort of describe to us a little bit who these, who these kids are that we're talking about, like sort of, you know, because I'm I'm thinking about you know Dale and DCF and DMH, and then I'm thinking of combining these. You know, you talked about somebody with a de de developmental disability and then somebody with a substance use. I'm like, should they be in the same facility together, or yeah. can, can you describe for Absolutely. us who we're talking about yeah. here? I think the other piece. Um, I would say is having, and I, I know there are other people in this room that have worked with children and youth, and, and um, I, I feel like sometimes when we talk about youth that are struggling this much, it can make it seem like, oh, these are bad kids, or these are dangerous kids, or that, and I just want to be careful also when I convey that these are children and youth with really acute <clears throat> challenges that also have trauma histories and things that brought them to having the behaviors and challenges they have. So for this level of care, we're talking about youth that have probably had a history of hospitalization or inpatient care. Some of the youth we see waiting in our emergency departments that have tried to, to hurt themselves or have tried to die by suicide. So it, it is really significant. Like this is not a program if a youth is struggling with anxiety or having a hard time kind of regulating themselves sitting still in school. Like that is not this level of care. And it's a level of care we haven't had. And so we do have youth that are sitting at the wrong place that may be inpatient and they've been there for weeks or months and, and they're stable and they don't need that. We have nowhere for them to step down to or go to. And so it it's that kind of level. And, and I, no, as we talk about, like also youth may have substance use, may have a developmental disability. Again, there is a really incredible team that sits together every week called the Case Review Committee. And it's made up of folks from mental health and from developmental disabilities and from the Agency of Education and from Family Services. And they are the folks that look at referrals for any residential level program, and they would for this. And they're making referrals based on what's appropriate. So they're looking at a lot of information together and would say, okay, this is a youth that a psychiatric residential treatment facility would be best for them. And so having them go there. So it, again, it becomes really specialized and it's from looking at what has gone on for youth and making sure that if we have them together, that's another consideration. Like, and it's part of what the case review committee does. They look at we have this group of youth and, and we want to be careful about the same thing. Like there's certain youth that work really well together and then others where it, it wouldn't be good for them for a multitude of reasons. And that is part of the consideration. Um, and the other piece, and I know it's further on the slides, is the age group we're talking about is 12 up to 21. And that sounds like a big stretch. So it's if they were there by 18. And it doesn't mean that those are all the ages we will have, but that is the rule for a PRTF set by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So that's, we're not talking about little children in this program, um, although 12, I would say is still little and young. Um, so that that's all that part of the consideration that goes into this. So we have uh, two questions and then we're gonna try and move on, okay. Anne and then Brian. Sure. Um, the earlier slide had mentioned uh, not locked beds, but a, a locked program, locked out of doors. And when I look at the whole, all of the new programs being proposed under the AHS uh, umbrella, I'm seeing like 41 new locked programs, uh, beds and locked programs. Um, in psychiatric hospitalization for kids, uh, you can only be placed in a locked psychiatric unit with the child's voluntary consent or a specific court order saying, you know, this uh, level of locked care. 
So I'm, I'm wondering whether that will be the same for this and also, um, and maybe this is also a future slide, but also uh, the rules and use and oversight of restraint and seclusion and what will happen at, again, this, uh, in a lot of ways that are the same level of restrictiveness as an inpatient psychiatric unit, locked doors, and I don't know what the restraint seclusion uh, issues will be. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so one thing I would say, you're right, so about it, a PRTF can have locked outer doors, not locked bedroom doors. Um, it's still, um, when we talk about locking, it's something that we take seriously. And many youth who will need this level of care also have histories of running away, and that creates other dangers if a youth leaves and they're lost, or um, we think about other things that can happen to youth that are vulnerable. Um, so that's a part of the decision making. Um, for restraints, um, seclusion and restraint, there's because this is something that is licensed by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So Dale actually has a team called Survey and Certification. Um, this is where it gets, it's really lovely. Like all of our departments really have spent a lot of time together. So they are like an arm of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And so they monitor any seclusion and restraint based on the federal law. And we will be looking at that. We being the multiple departments as well, will be reviewing those because of when anything that happens has to be reported, whether it's like a hand moving someone or um, a restraint. And so those are pieces that we will get and be looking at. Um, and I hear you about the beds. There's, you know, we, We've pulled some data from over a decade ago, and our decrease in being able to serve youth in state at a residential level of care has diminished by about 100 beds, and that includes any locked facility or other programming, and it's why we're now in this position where we have youth in this level of care out of state very far away. Um, so those are all pieces we are thinking about and looking at and so will there be a court order if a youth is not providing consent since it's a locked program? So this, this program, youth have to be voluntary. So it's not a court order. Um, and I, any of us that have talked to teenagers like aren't usually raising their hand like, yes, please let me go there. Um, so it also becomes a conversation of, um, you know, how, how can we make sure you're here and for anyone that works with this age group, like that becomes a different conversation, but it is, well, it's voluntary. Thank you. You're welcome. Brian, and then we'll move on. So luckily, um, most of my questions got answered and there's only one left. Good. So, <laughs> um, so one thing uh, we see is in the current situation when youth are placed out of state is, is, the, is this um, like severing their connections to resources in their communities, not just their families, but social support and, and professional, you know, like providers of, of services. And I noticed that Medicaid is funding the facility. I'm curious if uh, what the possibilities are for integration of community-based services to maintain continuity of care for youth. Um, for example, contracting with existing providers or contracting with providers before they discharge so that they can start you know, have like a warm handoff, um, or could those providers bill Medicaid directly while they're in the facility using like a code, the appropriate code? Like, have you have you explored that option and considered ways to maintain continuity of care um, at the facility? <laughs> what I was going to say, I mean, you're describing best practice for transition from any setting to another setting. And I appreciate that very much because you're right. I mean, in, in Vermont, theoretically, just by proximity and geography, we should be able to create some type of continuity and discharge planning. And I, I don't want to make assumptions because the, the operational details are not in my wheelhouse here, but um, it's very hard to do that when they're out of state. You're absolutely right. Do you want to speak to any of the specifics? Yeah. You know those, yeah. Um, part of the PR, um, now I'm yeah, because I've been saying psychiatric residential treatment facility, the acronym's not rolling off my tongue. Um, part of it is um, while they're there, making sure there's connection to community and discharge planning that doesn't look like just a discharge plan. Here you go. 
it's about how you have connection and they um, and having visits or having family or doing other things in community. So it is a piece that we are hoping will be much tighter than what we see when you send up out of state. That's good. And um, one, one thing just to consider is the potential for building telehealth facilities from the start, because now with with um, with the, the remote, you know, with remote treatment, it's possible to to maintain therapy in a way we couldn't before. And we don't see that out of state. But if it's within state before any interstate license licensure compacts pass, like there's no that barrier is not there. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, we have a great opportunity. So I appreciate that you're looking at that. Thank you. OK, go ahead. Thank you. All right, so the next slide, um, oh, sorry, two back, I think. One more back, two back, I think one more back. I think we're, try one more back. It's the horrible slide, yeah. this one. <laughs> so it's the horrible slide that we broke all the PowerPoint rules off. <laughs> so uh, I am not gonna read this to you. As long as I said, we're not gonna do that. This is to really show progression that we have been focused on what we need in our system of care for youth for many years. And I will say I've been in my role for nine years now. And so I was a part of the 2017 legislative report and the consultation we got across our departments in 2020 saying, what is our, what does it look like for um, any of our community-based and residential care? And so this is really for you to be able to see how we are working across departments, because I wouldn't want you to think that we came in here just individually and said, this is what we think. It was a lot of planning together. Um, and that includes family services and work that they are doing around um, for their youth that are justice involved. And for youth that are in the retreat, there are meetings every week where departments are coming together to talk about youth that are there, how do we work together, how do we move youth into the right place, and then also our state interagency team, which not only has our departments, but also has Family Voice. So the Vermont Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health and Vermont Family Network are part of that monthly meeting. So all of these pieces to say, like this was part of our thought process and that we don't have to look at this horrible slide for a second longer. <laughs> So we can go, yeah. So I feel like probably we got to, so I think we talked about all of these pieces as well. Questions right up front, so we can go to the next. Just Mark. And I don't know that, I think we've talked about this quite a bit as well in terms of thinking about the children and youth here as a common denominator and how um, in order for our departments to collaborate and successfully wrap around them and support them together, it's challenging to do so given that we have um, this hole in each one of our programming right now. Um, and this would certainly fill those gaps within each one of our uh, departments in order to more um, collectively serve these children and youth. Next slide. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah, ahead, no. no, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, you. <laughs> um, so I feel like we um, covered some of these pieces and again about the intensive placements and the numbers that have gone down. So I know we are sitting in front of you wanting to stand that has a physical impact, has more beds, and I feel like we are trying to get back to a place where we actually have the programming in our state so that we can keep not only our kids here, bring some back, and have closer ties to their community and their families. Um, we also think by having this in state that our hope is that youth and children won't need to be in this level of care as long as sometimes they are out of state because they can connect back to their community and see their families. Um, so, you know, there, as much as we may not love this idea, I think there is always going to be a need for this level of care because of acuity and mental health needs and wanting to keep youth safe and the community safe if they're struggling. And so it's it's both. We need to stand up programming and we need community support. So I think they are equally 
important. To the next slide, please. So we've talked about some of these pieces around hoping for shorter lengths of stay. Um, also just being able to move youth through where they need to be. So right now youth are getting stuck inpatient um, or are being honestly supported in the community in a way that isn't safe for youth, isn't safe for the staff helping them and for family members. And so this provides that filling of the gap that Monica spoke to so that hopefully youth will be moving more through where they need to be. Um, and that means, you know, youth that are waiting in the emergency department, it may not be that they directly would go to a PRTF, there are steps in between, but it means that if there were youth in the emergency department, there is probably another place in our system where other youth are stuck that they need to go to. And so youth having options and us being able to fit them to the right place where they're gonna get their needs met, um, we also, for, for families, I mean, it's hard um, when your child's at a state to have access to be able to see them, to travel. Um, it's another significant uh, stressor for families. And so all of these are pieces that we think having this in Vermont would really help youth and their families. So we can look at the I know we have a couple questions. I'm going to let them continue a little bit longer, and then we'll go on. Thank you. <clears throat> so next slide. So this is point in time data. So we pulled this last week. So this is the kind of data that the case review committee that I talked about tracks about referrals made to programs and it shows where youth are by department. So how many are in state, how many are out of state, and then out of state, how many are actually in a PRTF that's out of state. Um, I also will say these numbers fluctuate by the day. So this looking at data like this is how we helped to figure out the right size program in Vermont. Again, it's, you know, right now um, there's 16 youth out of state and a PRTF. There are another 22 youth pending referral for residential or PRTF. So we know it's not going to serve every youth, but it also is going to give us enough ability to move youth where they need to be and where it's best for them. Um, but it's data like this and looking at how many referrals are being made and tracking um, the case review committee and what challenges youth are coming into the case review committee being referred for residential. So this is just one piece of the data um, that we started tracking years ago so that we could plan better for things like a PRTF or other program. Would be a good place to pause for okay. this. Art. Yes, um, thank you for your presentation. Is the PRTF the highest, most acute level of care for children? Is is that it's what it's below inpatient? So is... inpatient hospitalization is the highest level. So at the retreat, if they're at inpatient hospitalization. Okay. I I, I still don't understand. So so this is a, a low level of care, you said? So it's it's confusing. And, oh, perfect. Yeah, really on it. Yeah, yeah. So um, the piece I will say about this, you'll see the PRTF at different levels, and it's because our systems have different services and supports yeah. within them. So, yeah. um, but it is, so if you look at the mental health one, like inpatient is the highest level. And then if we talk about, there's, a step down from inpatient hospital diversion and crisis stabilization. So that's really short term, like a few days. Okay. Um, and so a PRTF is not hospital level of care. Okay. Um, but it is very treatment focused. So it is for youth with really significant mental health challenges. Okay. And stop right there when you okay. say just for a second, just okay. so I understand. Significant mental health challenges. Does that mean mental illness or does it mean something different? And I always get confused here because we hear this a lot. Yeah. Can you help me? I can. Well, maybe I can. Um, <laughs> I might have to try real hard with me. But so 
Um, I will tell you, I say mental health because we're talking about children and youth. And but yes, it's having really significant illness, illness. that is okay. that is mental health related. Okay, so it, it is mental illness has been diagnosed, and those yes. are the folks that are going to be in yes. this program. Okay. And so it's part of like looking at like again, youth could have some lower level struggles they're having, like with anxiety. Yeah, or, right, right. It's right, not right. that level. Yeah. Like it's really severe challenges that impact them daily. So okay. they're having a hard time. Thank you. And when I think about those level, of, that level of care question was a really good one. And sometimes I have to frame it almost like in a medical system to think of something that might be, maybe feels a little more accessible to our brains, or at least to mine. So, you know, you've got an ICU where you go after you've had surgery and then you have a rehab facility where you're going to get a ton of care, intensive therapy around the clock support. Mm -hmm. And then there's home where you can get care in your home. But if you don't have that rehab in the middle, you're stuck in an ICU in a hospital where they're not actually equipped to give you all the PT, the OT, oh, okay. the S, all those services okay. that you it's really need to, to thrive okay. and reintegrate into your home environment. So we're in the rehab so you're, section. So you're, yeah, you're stuck in the hospital or you're okay. going home and getting not enough, not despite, not, not because the system's not trying, but this system over here at home can't, can't backfill what you really needed in, that, in the middle. How long will these kids stay in here for trial? That's a good question. Yeah, okay. It, We've got some data. Don't you depends. love it? It depends. depends. It's because it's based on them needing this level of care. They're assessed um, very, every 30 days, like looking at what are their mental health needs? Are they getting better? Can they step down? We don't want them there too long either. Okay, thank you. Melanie and then Dan. I heard you start speaking about the family connection and um, also speaking about the community. I was curious because a lot of our um, facilities for inpatient are in the South or will be in the South. I'm curious as how about transportation and how to get families physically to be able to access their children because that is often such a cr critical part of the healing, especially using your analogy if you're going to be able to get back home is having that nexus. And it's great that they're not out of state, but still... Southern Vermont can be very far. If you live yes. I'm just curious if you could speak to how that is being addressed. Yeah, I, you know, it, it's a great question. It's something we worry about. And um, there is like, even when folks are out of state, mm -hmm. the departments help um, if families are able to go help them like arrange transportation or with funding. And so this would be the same, like they, um, making sure, and then also the PRTF can help with that. Um, so that's that's a component. So there are resources if the family doesn't have a car or access to enough money to get get gas or all the pieces are still in this model. Dan, um, could you go back to the slide where it shows um, the where the how many people are on the waiting list or how many? I just wondered of the twenty two that are waiting for referral, where are they? How long have they been on that list? Um, I don't have the how long they've been on the list in front of me. I can tell you they are usually waiting at the wrong level of care. So they are, um, they may be at home with wrap services that are not enough. And so they aren't feeling safe. Their parents or family aren't feeling safe. They, because it's all of our departments, they may be, um, DCF may be staffing them. Um, and I certainly will let uh, DCF folks speak more to that, but there are staff that are also with kids 24 seven, supporting them um, and trying to keep them safe and keep themselves safe. It may be that a youth is at inpatient hospitalization waiting for a more appropriate residential bed. Um, so there are lots of places they can be waiting and they're usually waiting in the right place. So people do the best they can and it's, um, it has, it's not good for the youth. It's definitely not good for families who are scared or for staff. And what's the reason? Is I mean, is it just that there's not the capacity to um, put them in a PRTF, whether or non in state, out of state, whatever? What's the reason that there are wait lists out of state as well? So, um, and it's we aren't the only state, obviously, challenged mm -hmm. by workforce, and so. Some of it is not having the staff. Some of it is out-of-state PRTFs 
that will accept you from different states. Um, and so they end up on a wait list there. And so that is also constant triaging that staff across our departments are doing for the youth waiting. Like, what are they getting? And we're often working with our designated and specialized service agencies who are also trying to mm -hmm. wrap kids while they wait for this. Okay, thank you. And I'll, to put a fine point on that, it's really important to think about what's happening in those places that are trying to keep these kids safe because it's not a therapeutic, it's not therapeutic what's happening there. And those, whether it's the DCF workers or the designated agencies or SSAs, they're needing to be more intensive than they are designed to be is negatively impacting their ability to serve the kids and youth that they are intended to serve. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the ecological impact here can, is hard for us to mm -hmm. quantify. And we see it in the staff, like they are so drained because I hear people say, where are the designated agencies? Where are the SSAs? They're trying so hard, but they, they can't, manage these, it's not appropriate for them to be here. So you can see how the ripple continues. Yeah. I'm just gonna take another couple of questions that we're gonna need to um, uh, move on to. We wanna make sure that we get uh, all the present and we're only gonna be here, my committee's only gonna be here for uh, until 2.30. So um, we're gonna go uh, Noah and then Topper and then um, just wanna let witnesses know that we're going to do um, uh, Dale and DCF before mental health. And I know there were some other questions. Uh, healthcare, I can wait because we'll be here longer. That's okay, write it down. Okay. No one. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to help me understand the nature of the facility, could you just tell me the top three or four diagnoses that the youth will have in this facility? Top three or four. Um, just one or two is okay also. Yeah, one or two is fine. <laughs> Sorry, so yeah, who's, I mean, who's in there? Who's in this? Right, but yeah, do you want to describe them? Yeah, I. Um, so, kids that have severe trauma that may have emerging psychosis. Um, so, like schizophrenia, um, other is, um, similar. Um, they're. Uh, we could probably pull some data. I'm offering some. We could probably pull some data about the kids in Vermont that we currently have in PRTFs, if that would be helpful, just to see if confluence. I mean, I'm seeing I, lots of head shaking yeah, right to your um, that'd be helpful. Support system. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, they're complex and have multiple coexisting conditions and diagnoses going on, for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Topper. Um, thanks for coming in, and. Uh, I don't dispute how hard everybody's working. I just want to say that up front. I have one question. You made a statement, I believe, and if I didn't hear it right, just say you didn't hear it right. Um, you can't provide the services in a home that you provide, that you will be providing in uh, this particular facility. My question is, why not? It's a great question. Um, so, and I think there's a handful of answers. The level, the level of staffing that that would require, we're talking about some kids that in the community would probably be best served by two to one, 24 seven. Our workforce does not allow for that. And to be real, I don't think it ever is going to allow for us to provide two to one services to the number of kids and youth that would need it in order to safely and successfully live in the community. The logistics of managing the, the, the logistics around that are overwhelming to even consider. Um, and that's not even to say that that would be the right answer because it's not just a human there to make sure that you don't, you know, hurt yourself or someone else. There is so much more therapeutic in it that goes into it so that hopefully we move out of this level of care. This is a, this is a system. This is a continuum that we expect children and youth to move through. Um, and so for, scaling and titrating services in a home with the workforce challenges we have, even probably under the best of workforce circumstances would be incredibly hard, although a beautiful idea. Um, 
the other piece, so other than the logistic piece, you know, I think back to my time as a, I was a LEND fellow. So the leadership in education and neurodevelopmental disabilities over at UVM. And I had the opportunity to learn about the importance of leadership in the neurodevelopmental space. But the thing that was the best about the education was it was, you know, me as sort of like a healthcare provider in the field, but then I was learning against, I was learning next to self-advocates and advocates and family and caregivers. And of this population and no one model. What I learned to took away from there is variety is the spice of life. You know, we were told day one, use person-centered language, a person with autism. A person with autism in my class said, excuse me, I prefer to be referred to as an autistic person. It, everybody needs something different and it looks different for every person. And for me, this is thinking about the menu of services that we need to provide in the state in order to best care for these kids. So what you described, while I think would be beautiful and a great fit for some people, if we could staff it, might not actually be the right thing for them or what they want. Okay, so now, now I have a response to that. Um, can't remember what year it was. Brandon Training School was closed. Mm -hmm. We promised people that the services that they were getting would be provided locally. So what you, I, I want to make sure now. Yeah. What you're saying is we can't do that. Is that what you're telling me? I don't or know. Ross telling us? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what services were provided at Brandon Training School that we provide that we promised to provide locally. I have no doubt that when that closed, there were the absolute best of intentions to provide them at a local basis and in a home and community-based way. I have absolutely no doubt that that was the desire and the hope. But we're also reckoning with reality. And so um, how do we keep the health and well-being of these children and youth, their families, their caregivers, and hold true to that and recognize what resources we have to support them? It is incredibly hard, and it's not going to make everybody happy. I often think that if we're able to effectively improve the system of care in one place, that just like we're seeing how it's not working in one place, there's a ripple effect. If we can improve it in one place, there's a ripple effect. So I would love, I would appreciate more history and more of a lesson on, on what that dialogue looked like, what those promises were. And because I understand that that is a huge part of Vermont's history and there's, there's a lot there. I, I think um, also just to step in just for a moment, I, I think that, um, you know, we're all familiar with a, a designated system, the designated mental health and developmental disabilities system of providers. And being a designated agency carries with it um, a set of rights, but also a set of responsibilities. And um, uh, I think some of us have some questions about you know, how much are we carrying forth on the responsibility side um, and recognizing that, you know, um, it's a struggle to have cost of living increases. It's a struggle to keep some of the staff, all of what you said, this facility is going to have those same struggles. And we seem to be OK with putting a boatload of money into a facility based program um, and that same boatload of money, I think some of us have questions about whether or not that same boatload, um, which would also be Medicaid eligible, um, could potentially serve some of these folks in the community. I, um, so I think, you know, I'm just following up on Topper, but um, so we just are left with some of those questions um, because it's not going to be inexpensive to run this facility. And um, and thinking about um, mixture of populations, and you talked about peers, and um, I'm thinking of um, you know bullying mm -hmm. on my side of the thing, and I'm thinking of um, things that uh, you know have the potential to increase the trauma for children and youth in this facility. Maybe that's just because I um, you know am thinking in that way, but I. Uh, I appreciate, you know, your comments, Topper, and uh, I um, appreciate also that we need to um, take a look at what's in front of us now and to figure out 
is this going to be something that's going to be beneficial? And for me, the question is the jury's still out on that. But I guess I, I'm willing to to look forward and say, you know, let's see if this has an impact like we hypothesize that it will um, as a missing component in Vermont's system of care. Um, but I, I don't want to, I guess, let up on the pressure of our designated and specialized service agencies to serve these kids in the community um, and our education system to meet the needs of kids, um, not at two hours a week. Uh, so. And the other thing is, there's another gap too. Older people that. Uh, yeah, let's not, uh, yeah, let's not diverge into that. <laughs> oh. This is only about kids up to 21. <laughs> we do a good job. Yeah. For the most part, yeah, the kids, but that's that other, yeah. Well, we, that... we're not doing that here today, Topper. No, I know you're not. Okay, okay. I, all right. So, yeah, uh, uh, you can move ahead. Um, I just wanted to add, I think, you know, if we think of parity between mental and physical health, I also, this is a specialized area of care. And so, when you ask about diagnosis, I honestly like they don't roll off my tongue because I. I don't think in those terms. Um, I can tell you like what a youth would look like that's having a struggle. So severe depression where they are wanting to die or they are cutting themselves. Like that is a level of care that we need in addition to community-based care. Like I don't think we, we need both, it's both and. Like we need both of these because someone trying to have eyes on a youth 24 seven in a home when staff may be there and then they have to leave. And like, I think it's, it is a risk if we don't have all these levels of care the way we do for physical health. So, so let's, uh, let's um, continue yeah. on. <clears throat> so fiscal, it's always important to remember that these children and youth already exist. Uh, we are already paying for services for many of them delivered out of state. Um, this rate would actually include room and board costs, which is unlike other residential programs. Um, and there is already base funding, a base funding line item to establish this in-state service. Uh, we're beginning with six months. <clears throat> um, really for us to, to get a sense of what this looks like. And as we start up, and then ongoing funding decisions will be made very much based on these pressures as we do with other Medicaid reimbursable services. So next steps in this, um, which there have been many and continue to be more, um, we are doing contract work. We also, because this isn't a service that we've provided, we'll be doing a state plan amendment to add it. Um, we did um, reach out and got a copy of the certificate of need that the, the vendor um, had put in to see if they would need one. So that's additional information. Um, the reason the funding request is in is because before any youth can step foot, they obviously need to staff up and be ready and then start having youth um, either who are on this wait list or um, maybe out of state to come home. And then it's also on our radar that there's a moratorium on independent schools. So to the education point, there is the ability to do, um, to have in person through learn well, which does tutoring. It's four and a half hours a day. Um, it's not a full school day. So that's another piece that's on our radar as well around this. Yeah. What was the date of the um, three mountain care board notification of not meeting the ceiling? It was August of uh, last year. Yeah, they have that, that is done. that was not for this program, it was for a residential program and three mountain care is reevaluating that because it was not okay. It was not a representation of this program. Okay. So that it talked about both on it, but I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. You're done with us. Okay. Well, so uh, yeah, yeah just, just, just one thing because you're the inter you're the interagency person, yeah. Monica. Um, so you know, I, we all have this saying that when everybody's in charge, nobody's in charge. Mm -hmm. And so I have this I have this thing about um, 
uh, oversight, quality assurance. I know Dale's going to be sort of the certification, survey and certification. That's kind of different than the sort of ongoing day to day um, check ins around the progress of the youth and the con uh, coming back to um, what Brian was talking about earlier the continued connections to the community. Um, and who at the state level um, uh, is going to be sort of like overseeing um, the quality and the, um, I guess, vendor agreement, I guess it'd be a Medicaid provider agreement, um, since it's not going to be a grant, it doesn't look like it'll be a grant, it'll be Medicaid billing. So, um, so who's going to have overall responsibility um, for the PRTF at the state level? He was holding the contracts. So we meant it when we said literally every department has a, has a hand in this. Um, and right now, I think, not I think, I am really holding this from a responsibility standpoint um, with incredible support and partnership and legality from my department. So if we, if we, or when, I'm, I might say, yep. uh, when we get a constituent call and a frantic parent calling about a complaint about the care that their youth is getting, Monica is the person we're supposed to call. 802-336-2243. I think I made that up. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I've got, I've got, I've got to look it up my, on my... That's all right. My compute, my brain. Right. Thank you. Uh, just a quick follow-up to that question. Will there be any external outside of AHS oversight? We have CMS rules and regs that we have to follow. Um, it's a great question. It, CMS can ask Dale Survey and Certification to do this, or they can do it. But when I say it's part of Dale, like it, they're really separate from being part of Dale. Um, because they are an arm of CMS for this particular thing. Yeah, survey and certification kind of like follow their own set of, uh, they're, they're really, it's mostly federally funded, they're, they're um, follow their own thing around hospitals and inpatient facilities. So uh, in Dale language, we consider this an inpatient facility, but uh, okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, so who wants to go next? I heard you say you wanted to prioritize, prioritize Dale and DCF and DMH last. Yeah. Sorry. You can just, you can, <laughs> you can decide amongst you who wants to go first. Eric, and then Eric, Bob. Eric, Sorry. Eric, Eric. We won't forget to. <laughs> yes. Thank you for bringing that up. It's like Dale's coming. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I really appreciate that. <laughs> I'm going to stay here. This is a very cute picture. I should be guessing that kid's not going to pick up. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So for the record, I'm Jennifer Bedian. I'm the Developmental Disability Services. Yeah, we had to speak up. speak up. Sorry, it's a big away. room. We're far away. <laughs> For the record, I'm Jennifer Garabedian. I'm the Developmental Disability Services Division Director. And I'm Ellie Pedersen. I supervise a specialist team for the division, and I'm currently covering the children's specialist role. So we do have um, just two quick slides. Most of the information was covered by our colleagues, um, but it will give you an opportunity to obviously ask us any questions about um, sort of our role and our support for the PRTF. Yeah. Um, we would just like to highlight that although um, certainly residential level of care facility-based support is not generally something that falls within the purview of developmental disability services, which is primarily a home and community-based set of service supports, um, our the Developmental Disability Services Act does provide us a set of guiding principles. Um, chief among is the um, Principle for children's services, which is that children remain with their their um, families and communities. So having children end up in facilities outside of the state really flies in the face of that. Building a PRTF in Vermont would bring them closer to their homes and communities while they're receiving treatment and allow, as we discussed, for better transitions and 
visitations and connections to their communities while they're receiving their care before returning back to their home, which is um, in large part why we are in support of the release. So um, we've experienced um, certainly recently a number of examples of individuals who have had delayed, transi delayed transitions um, or troubling transitions because of a lack of um, community engagement prior to their discharge date um, and because they've been in Pennsylvania or Florida or Massachusetts and the um, receiving entity and community providers have not had adequate access to develop relationships, build trust, or simply meet the child before bringing them back to the state. So having um, a, a facility here in Vermont certainly um, we feel would benefit um, our agencies in their endeavors to help um, their transitions improve. Um, next slide, please, Rebecca. As Monica and um, Cheryl discussed, our current state has resulted in repeated presentations to emergency departments, admissions to the retreat without appropriate disposition, and in adequate community-based supports. Um, certainly kids are um, being supported in the wrong level of care currently. And the acuity surpasses um, our community-based capacity. Um, DAs and SSAs, as well as other community partners are not able to adequately meet the complexity of care in the community. So we are sending kids um, to PRT apps out of state, having something in state would certainly better meet our children's needs. Um, so having treatment and stabilization prior to returning to the community-based supports would allow us to um, better meet their needs and get them into home and community-based services much more quickly. Additionally, having an uh, in-state option would help as we um, transition children to guardianship when kids are out of state, we have an additional complexity related to um, having guardians, especially public guardianships, often registering a guardian out of state, a Vermont guardian out of state is particularly challenging and sometimes we're not recognized. So that can be an additional complexity in supporting um, young adults uh, who are out of state. I believe that those are our slides. So if there are any questions, I oh, I did want to add though, there is a billing mechanism that was brought up that agencies are able to stay up to date on the, the child's um, uh, supports and how they're doing and to be ready for them to transition, but that doesn't replace the face-to-face -face in person relationship building so the child actually feels comfortable with the team that's going to be supporting um, them when they return to Vermont. So I just wanted to make sure folks know that. So what would be the mechanism that the department um, the department uses in order to support the designated and specialized service agencies to be able to um, you know, have these children and youth return to the community as soon as possible? So what kinds of supports are the, is the department prepared to provide to the DAs and SSAs to um, help them carry out their roles and responsibilities as DAs. So as Melody is um, referencing, currently DAs can continue to bill for service coordinating for the bridge program while children are in a residential facility. So they can continue to maintain that contact. Typically, um, bridge services is a more um, widespread service. So it, not only is it with the child, but it's with the family. So it would allow both transition supports um, to be built between the family, um, which might get a, I forget, I apologize, I forget who asked the question about trans transportation, thank you, trans transportation services and connecting the family with the child. That's a good, perhaps facilitate some of that, but also connect the child and, and the case manager, the service delivery entity with the child while the child is receiving the stabilization um, services at the PRT. Mark? Yes, uh, we just heard about uh, kids with, with uh, mental health issues and oh. mental health 
How does developmental disabilities relate to that? Right. Just so I know the difference between them. Yeah, thanks for asking. That's a really important question. So as Cheryl mentioned, there's a really important screening process that goes into this. And so these are really the uh, highest level of care in these children. And so these are kids with developmental disabilities okay. who have co-occurring needs. So they likely have um, significant trauma histories, co-occurring mental health conditions, um, perhaps some substance abuse issues. So they... Um, have a really complex presentation and have those co-occurring. So they likely do have a mental health condition as well as a development. Okay, so condition. these are the, the, the I hate to yeah. use phrases, but the toughest group to, to serve. Yeah, yeah, we are talking about a very small slice of the population. Right, right. And it really is that Venn diagram of kids who have a, a big constellation of needs. And they're hitting a bunch of, of our different sort of sectors. And, and just a quick follow is a lot of this genetic, they were born this way and that's what they are. It's incredibly possible that they have genetic conditions and, right. and that's okay. that part right. of it. Yeah. yeah, not necessarily. No, the only, I understand. Yeah, but yeah, it's possible. I just want to understand what we're talking about. Yeah, you. great. Yeah. Question. Um, and I think I just have one uh, final question. So uh, before the break, we heard testimony from DCF staff um, around the incredible challenges that they're having doing what they call staffings. Um, and they pointed to a large contingent of those of uh, being um, youth with developmental disabilities. And um, would you envision, and maybe I'll ask Erica this question as well, but would you envision that some of these youth are people who would be accessing this this level of service? It's possible that some of these those children could could rise to this level um, I, without knowing more. I, I guess I, I'm not entirely. Perhaps the deputy commissioner would be better um, situated to answer that question. She um, works in that population a little bit more. I can say that we are um, particularly proud of the relationships that we're deepening with um, DCF and some of the, the work that we're partnering with our um, Vermont Crisis Intervention Network to, to provide some additional support and training um, for the, the tremendous work that the, um, the um, F FSD team is doing to support those kids. Um, so I, again, it is a pretty modest number of kids that we would expect to see with developmental disabilities who would rise to the level of admission here, but um, certainly, uh, I, you know, we are working hard to help um, address the, the crisis that's happening where kids are being staffed um, directly by UCS. Thank you very much for being here today. Appreciate it. And I think we'll move to the CCF folks. Ever since COVID, we haven't had the nice big room where we have joint right. hearings and all this stuff. So we have to make do with what we have. <laughs> Welcome. The floor is yours. Good morning or good afternoon, I should say. I'm Erica Radke, Deputy Commissioner of the Family Services Division. Uh, uh, yourself. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. My name is Tyler Allen. I'm the Adolescent Services Director for the Family Services Division. I would have a just a couple of slides, and I know you've heard a lot of uh, material, so I'll go through those uh, pretty quickly, and then if you do have any questions, I'd love to answer those for you. So uh, one thing I wanted to point out is that the, um, the PRTF really is a nice part of our continual care that we would like to see added. Uh, part of our high-end system of care, which is described in detail in our Act 23 report, identifies four distinct types of programs that really bolster the most critical elements of our Family Dis Services Division's statewide system of care. And those programs are the short-term secure stabilization, 
short-term secure treatment, staff secure crisis stabilization, and the PRTF. And really adding a PRTF to this uh, treatment array, it really aligns and supports our long-held values uh, and goals as a division of ensuring the right program at the right time for the right length of time for that small population of youth that we have that are placed in residential care. And I did want to point out, I think it's important to note that um, of the, we have about 944 kids in care right now, only 8.9% of them are in residential care at this point. Um, the next slide is um, want to mention that, you know, PRTL level operates uh, not only as a step down from a higher acuity level of placement, uh, such as, but you can then use it as an intermediate step to a lower level of placement, such as community, community based residential care or even foster care with support and stabilization services. <coughs> so, in certain situations, the PTRF can promote the downward trend that we have been seeing lately in the number of DCF youth that are in residential care. And that's another important reason for us to want to have a PTRF here in Vermont. I know we've talked about a lot of other reasons in terms of having this care where youth can have family and community nearby as well, but also the idea of having a PRTF when it's appropriate for these youth to be able to move down to a lower level care to have it right here in Vermont, because I do hope that that would promote when appropriate that type of progression. Um, in terms of talking about the downward trend in uh, residential care for DCF, uh, as of February 1st, we had 84 kids out of 94 that were in our custody, uh, which were in residential care. So that was 8.9%. 84 out of 944, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Sure. <laughs> and you know, like I said, this number's been trending down for years, and it's really the lowest that it's been in a decade. So in comparison, 10 years ago, we had 15% of our youth placed in residential care. Um, but I do want to note that the numbers don't tell the whole story. Uh, part of the reason we've had this downward trend since the pandemic, at least, is that um, we have uh, our system of care is operating at about 51% of its pre-pandemic capacity. So that means we don't have enough beds necessarily to meet the needs of our youth. And that's resulted in what people have been talking about today is a number of our youth then being staffed in alternative settings, such as emergency rooms, district offices, and other uh, staffing locations throughout the state while we're waiting for a more appropriate setting. And of course, that's absolutely not good for our kids. And it does put a significant stress and strain on my staff as well. So when I look at the PRTF, I look at this as having uh, just part of our continuum of care, having adequate uh, treatment settings in adequate numbers. So that'll provide a well-rounded system in order to care for our kids in the best way that they need. And then hopefully then promote uh, an, uh, an environment for step down when that's medically indicated so that these kiddos can get back to community-based care probably with wraparound or support services. Um, thank you, Erica. Um, one quick question. So who is going to be doing the, uh, uh, everybody's talked about the admissions um, or uh, assessment, the initial assessment the, to determine whether or not this level of care is the appropriate. Is that going to be done by CRC? Is that going to be done by the retreat? Who, who, is, who is doing the uh, initial sort of assessment and referral for this level of care. That would still be within that CRC. Process. It would, okay. All right. And for, for those in healthcare, what is the CRC process? It's the process that Cheryl did, uh, explained at the beginning of it. It's the community review committee where you have members of Dale and DCF, AOE, uh, Agency of Education is also involved with that. Um, as well as the Department of Mental Health. So it's a committee of people who meet every every week to go through those cases that are brought by any agency um, that are saying, we believe that this level of care is indicated. And then as a group, they talk about 
what is what is the recommended level? What does CRC stand for? Community review, uh, community case, review committee. Case review. Oh, sorry, case oh, review case committee. Review. Sorry, mm -hmm. my apologies. Yeah, I said community review committee the first time. Sorry, it's, it's kind of the process you have to go through before you get a quote yep. unquote approved for out of state residential. Yeah. Uh, and just the second half of that, but once the referral is made, does the retreat then? They also have an admission process, or do they? Would they automatically take a child, or would they then? Uh, have an admission process as to whether they felt that felt the child met their level of care. That's an excellent question, Representative. Uh, I believe there is an admission protocol involved. Um, I I don't think I can speak to all the detail of what's in there, but they do have a an admission protocol, and that's really about identifying is this youth going to have their needs to be able to be met within this milieu at this time. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Jessica. Um, Thank you very much. And also, thank you for the tour in Middlesex. That helps me to think about what this PRTF could look like in comparison, I believe. Because it seems like there is more of a, a holding pattern right now. And so I go back and look at the chart that had the pink in it, and there's a line, DCF. Um, youth in and out of the state program that isn't a PRTF is 39, youth in and out of the P of state PRTF, 10. I'm just curious how the, are you thinking that all of these folks that are on this list that are in and out and so forth, are they, when they're in, are they in Middlesex right now? And no. Okay, no. so they're in community, a community spot. Um, <laughs> folks are all out of state. All out of state. It's all yeah. And yeah. out. Not so, not just okay. In, so yeah, in and out of state, in in and in, 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 out dash of dash state, yeah. in <laughs> in and out of state. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> and and mostly I'm just trying to figure out. There seems like there's a lot more kids that need a spot. Than, than there is yeah. bad. I was trying to figure out how they really got to 15. It seemed yeah, more yeah, about right. Medicaid eligibility than it did anything else, to be honest. But yeah, uh, there are a lot more kiddos that yeah. need beds. And that goes back to that 51% um, reduction in our bed capacity. capacity. Mm -hmm. And then what the time, what's what I know that you talked about the timing a little bit in different in the different reports, but what are what do you think <laughs> today? As far as Middlesex or, or PRTF or the PRTF we're talking about? I believe our objects, I'm looking over to our colleagues, we were shooting for this summer for the PRTF program to be operational. There's a number of steps involved in, in actually making that happen. Um, Middlesex, uh, I think a similar timeline, we do have the renovations to that facility. Um, already completed, but there's a lot of steps towards actually getting a provider on, getting staff hired, getting training put in place, mm -hmm. getting that contract finalized, working through those components. So we had been more hopeful that this month was going to be the month for Middlesex. I would like to clarify that Middlesex distinctly is a program for um, youth that have delinquency uh, attached to their case profile. It doesn't mean there aren't treatment needs. We don't believe, we believe any youth placed within a program should have treatment needs that we are addressing in a treatment program. That being said, when we talk about our high-end system of care, we refer to a type of system of care as crisis stabilization program. And that is really identified as a programming that should be very short-term. Um, it is about finding out what are the assessed needs for treatment um, and getting them to those assessed needs. In order for them to be in a secure placement, like we're talking about with Middlesex, they would have to have a delinquent, a delinquency attached to them that make them appropriate for that level of care based on their, their exposure to the, you know, to the juvenile justice system, which is different than PRTF. It doesn't mean that they can't be placed in a PRTF with a delinquency, but um, it is not a requirement for PRTF. So can, yep. that's, Check in. Can we switch to Vaz? Yes. So we, I want everyone to see the weights in the hospitals, if that works, and then you all can determine where you are. So I think the one last question, why we just because it is specific to mm -hmm. this witness, is I'm going to ask you the same thing I asked Dale. So 
we have a need to increase our capacity in residential. We're, we're still at far below what we were prior to COVID. What is the department doing? We don't really see budget requests to increase capacity there. Um, just like we haven't seen budget requests from Dale to you know assure that we can meet these kids' needs in the community. What is it that the department is doing to uh, try to increase the capacity of our, you know, the folks who are doing residential in state that we have lost? Uh, a lot, it, it all depends. A lot of what we've been doing is trying to, you know, work with what we have, right? So we've been uh, trying to increase our uh, foster care group. And that's what one of the slides there does mention that the uh, high end system of care task force is thinking about doing a foster care summit, looking at retention, but also recruitment. And we would be trying to look for recruitment, uh, particularly for more specialized foster parents or parents that have will be interested in having training to handle our more high end youth. Um, another thing is uh, one of the budget requests we did have is for support and stabilization funds. And that's specifically to uh, provide a wraparound for kiddos, either in foster care, uh, primary foster care settings that need attentional uh, help as far as their mental health needs. And that's something that has been really successful in keeping kiddos home so then they don't necessarily have, or in foster homes, so they don't necessarily have to go to residential care. Um, in terms of residential care, uh, we have been really focused on our secure, you know, area of treatment that we've been discussing. And also, uh, there is a smaller program in Wyndham we are working on for a staff secure crisis stabilization program as well. And that would be a two-bit program. So we're really trying to do it a few levels in terms of the highest uh, secure, then our staff secure a couple of beds there, and then really trying to bolster our foster care ranks with that stable support stabilization wrap. And, and that's what we've been focusing. But uh, Tyler, do you have? I, one thought that's been occurring to me that I'd like to offer to the committee to consider, I don't I think it's a perspective we haven't talked about yet among, among, across our group, which is, um, and it's unique to DCF's perspective on that. DCF does hold a value that we want to be serving the kids we serve within the community, close to their family as much as possible. Um, but also part of that is we recognize DCF's involvement with family often comes with its own gravity, its own weight. DCF becoming the custodian in a family um, introduces a degree of challenge to that family dynamic that isn't, you know, that we'd hope isn't necessary. We hope to avoid as much as possible. And so when we talk about a program like a PRTF program that is more accessible to youth in Vermont, uh, and we talk about those youth who are as we've said already, placed within an inappropriate level of care where we can't meet their needs, whether this is a DCF staffing situation or they're in a hospital setting too long or they're in a crisis stabilization program or something like that, those settings or within the homes in the community, those settings provide a greater likelihood that other factors are gonna come up while a kid is not getting what they need within their family environment, that's when uh, perhaps an aggressive outburst or an assault happens within the home where the family says, I can't do this anymore, and I can't pick them up from the hospital. It, it, it can escalate things. And so that is sometimes when DCF actually be, is coming to the table as the custodian because things have gotten worse. And so having access to this, um, even though we're talking about the very highest level of residential care that we would be offering in many ways, sub-hospital, we're there's also a preventative lens to this, which is we are keeping these families together and, and working together. And that's really a value for DCF as well, um, how we can work with them without having to open up custody in a case. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. We appreciate, appreciate you being here. Good time. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you.
Sorry, this is the worst. <laughs> okay, much better. It has to go pretty quickly, okay. so can go through this quickly. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Devin Green um, from the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems, and I have with me today. Emma Harrigan, also with Boz. And thank you for having us in. I want to quickly note, um, we are here to describe the ripple effect that you heard about from Monica and Cheryl earlier and the impact that it has on hospitals. And I do want to briefly thank Emma and the emergency departments because they work very hard to collect this data. Often this data is hand collected. Um, and right now we're working with VDH to have it automatically collected, but this has been a tremendous effort by Emma and we really appreciate it. So thank you. Um, and what we want to say is we want to start off with some good news, which is that ED volumes have decreased from this time last year. Um, we had about 50 youths, um, an average waiting over 24 hours in emergency departments that has been reduced to 20. We think there is potentially some impact from all the DMH um, initiatives that they've started. Um, and we think that this is a great trend. At the same time, 20 youths waiting emergency departments is 20 too many. Um, and often these youths are um, the majority of those waiting are waiting for multiple days, not just 24 hours. So the way we took this data was we looked at all the young folks coming in with um, a mental health complaint as a primary complaint. We narrowed it down to those waiting over 24 hours. We thought that that was the population we should be looking at. And um, most often, uh, the folks who are waiting over 24 hours are waiting um, for multiple days. And we do think that that is due in part to um, being unable to get placed. Right now, we only have one inpatient unit in Vermont um, and for, for young folks. And we, we have seen there that there's been an average of nine post-acute adolescents who are waiting per month. Um, and at times there have been almost half of the inpatient census waiting for placement. And this could be due to trying to identify a placement, um, waiting for a placement to become available or guardians not picking up the youth on the discharge date. So we do think that that sort of middle level of care, that step down care would help alleviate the pressures that are in hospitals currently. Great, that was quick. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Anyone? Ever? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm looking at your uh, presentation. When you when you use the term youth, what, what does that? That's a really. I feel like I, I feel like we've heard that's a really good question, but that is a really good question. Actually, um, the data we've cut for you is based on anyone under the age of 18. But while we were talking, I did run the same numbers for youth age 12 through 21, and the trends and the volumes will be same. So we can cut it anyway, I would say. Sorry. Yeah, I, I get what you can feel, and it isn't hard, I know, but it seems like we have heard that beds are available in places, and it just, I, I get confused as to why it's still, in, I, I don't know. I mean, it, we've, we've had in healthcare, at least, to my memory, this year, we've heard that, gee, you know, beds aren't, aren't 
as restrictive as they were, why we still have kids waiting? Yeah, and I would say, you know, the increase in bed availability, the efforts by Brattleboro Retreat to increase transportation yeah. options, for example, all those initiatives within the last year, I think it's what's contributing to the number of kids waiting less and less. So going from 50 in March of 2023 to about 20 in January. But I think we haven't quite done the system of care work to really get at those, the We're kids left. that are left. Right. The kids, okay. that, you know, this might be kids with more acute needs or, or complexities that, that kind of make them fall into different. this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so I think, I think that's where this middle level of care can help kind of create more capacity and opportunity. Okay. So we, we are improving, but there's still... We still have a ways to go. So everyone hold still, you're gonna go? Yes, um, so for uh, Human Services Committee, we will meet back in committee at three. So you have a little bit of a break right now. And everyone else could stay, you'll get a break at three. <laughs> uh, take your name, take your name tag with you. <laughs> yep, no, stay, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> <laughs> and just want to say thank you to our colleagues here in um, House Healthcare and to all the witnesses. And we're sorry we can't hear the. <laughs> I did look at your slides. Yeah. I do have questions, but I'll be in touch. I don't do well with the slides. I'm better at it's all good. I asked Emily, why is this that family? Yeah, have happy family. Yeah, good see. And they got like nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Healthcare. Does anyone have questions yeah. for um Vaz right now? Oh, you forgot his name tag. No. Oh, I'll take it. Oh, here. Are we good? I, I have like a sort of like confirmation. Sure. Just um, would it be fair to say that one of the benefits of this additional treatment? Option is that it it like there's a word we use I can't remember what it was called it's not clogged flow there we go it's like it's related it's like fluid dynamics term you know like but the idea that like people could go to the P R F yeah P R T F people could go to the P R T F from the emergency room but they could also step down from a higher level of care or move up from diversion and so like having this piece where people could flow through it, then it allows people to move through the other levels easier. So, I mean, it, it sounds like it's another important. That's um, exactly right. Yeah. Piece. It's part of the care continuum. I have a question. I'm not sure if it's going to be for you two or for um, DMH. So we talk about the, the placement process this, through the case review. Um, what, what group is involved in that placement process? which looks at the kids staying in the hospital. I think that might be a question for- Okay, so we'll, okay, so we'll wait till, okay. Yeah. Any other questions for Vaz, Tapa? Yes. Um, the, the people that you have in those hospital beds that are staying there, um, are they justice-involved youth or are they- We can follow up. I don't up. know, yeah. I, I don't believe they are. I don't think they are, but we can- Not. Yeah. Well, and if anything, their their justice involvement is not the reason for yeah, delay. Okay. Yeah. They're, the reason for delay is that there is a level of care that is not available. Right. So it's not like there's a court date or or. It's what you're saying is there there is not available uh, support treatment and support for people who are, let's say, intellectually disabled. Is that what you're saying? Well, this data is looking at, I mean, that is possible, but this data is looking at primary complaint as mental health complaint. And so there could be co-occurring, you never know what a person might, but. Okay. But I just want, like, we, I think we could ask a follow-up question to the retreat on folks who are delayed, children and youth who are delayed placement and ask how many of them have an intellectual or developmental disability and how many of them are just a just developmental disability. Yeah. We can see what we can get. Like if there's more context to those kids, we can, we can get for you. I'm, I'm thinking of the kind of people that are, would be going into mm -hmm. this facility that we're talking about. 
That's why I was asking gotcha. what kind of people are in your hospital beds waiting. Yeah, yeah. Are they so, just, as, just as involved or not? Okay, thank you. Let me take that back. I would say <laughs> I will look at our numbers for what we collect point in time. My impression is most of those individuals are not justice involved. DMH on the justice involved side has dozens, I would say, in any given year. I'm, I know, I'm looking at Emily, but <laughs> you have heard us. I mean, I think we can talk a little bit about what our hospital units look like from a mixture of both um, folks who have a developmental disability, um, mental illness, um, substance use challenges. Um, I think we can talk about that um, when, okay, we have when you come up. It's, I think that's a really good question. <laughs> okay, why don't we make the switch? Thank you. Thanks, Emma and Devin. Thank you. And then I do know people have had questions. I promise we will get to them. So I'm hoping others in the room can stay till three. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Usually I have hardness. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, for the record, my name is Emily Hawes, uh, Commissioner for the Department of Mental Health. And I'm Laurel Oland, the Director of the Child and Adolescent Family Unit at the Department of Mental Health. Uh, so we also have a couple of slides to talk through with folks. Um, I also wanted an opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the questions and testimony that you all have heard today. Uh, so first, I'm going to go into those comments before I get into our two slides. Great. I'll apologize on behalf of us. We don't have a picture of happy families, but that is not because we don't care about happy families. <laughs> uh, this was uh, just our stock PowerPoint. Uh, um, so one of the, the common themes that I heard earlier during testimony uh, was the makeup of, of a particular unit um, and who is on that unit and concerns about uh, bullying or mixing folks with different diagnoses in one space. Uh, what I'd like to comment on is that individuals who are in a hospital level of care um, and also this level of care, which is a step down from a hospital, are oftentimes on a mixed unit. Whether they're in Vermont or at an out-of-state um, facility, individuals with complex needs are typically um, receiving services all within the same unit. Um, they don't, most facilities are not able to, nor does it require separation out. Uh, it's purely based on somebody's diagnosis. Um, so I wanted to uh, take an opportunity to, to put that out there just because that seemed to be um, a concern that folks were for voicing. Um, the other thing uh, that came up was around um, concerns around uh, seclusion and restraint practices, which is something that we all think about. None of us want to uh, put hands on an individual or seclude them, um, but that does happen and that is a tool um, in the toolbox, so to speak. Uh, what we would look to do, though, is continue our work with the PRTF that we've done uh, across our healthcare system with six core strategies. And six core strategies is an initiative that uh, the state um, has undergone for the past, might be 10 years old now or more, um, to um, have a goal of zero seclusion and restraint. And six core strategies is a multifaceted approach to uh, leadership style, workforce engagement, um, approaches to treatment and uh, engaging with individuals who are in the care of, of the folks, uh, whether that's in a facility, whether that's in an emergency room, whether that's out in the community, uh, so that everyone understands that the goal is zero restraint and seclusion. And there are facilities who achieve that. Um, and so when we think about uh, the Brattleboro Retreat, they've had a tremendous shift in the amount of seclusion and restraint that they have engaged in on their inpatient level. They've um, engaged wholeheartedly in the six four strategies approach. And we anticipate that work to continue um, if we move forward with a PRTF there. 
um, and they've been at the table for those conversations and how to engage their workforce on that project. Um, so I just wanted an opportunity to, to put that out there uh, before I talk about our circle. Um, this group is not usually seeing our pyramid. We switch things up, a uh, different audience. Um, but today, um, I thought it might be more beneficial to talk about our circle, um, which is someone to prevent, someone to call, someone to respond, and somewhere to go. And I chose this because some of the conversation has been, we're only hearing about vets. And you're only hearing about vets in this particular conversation because it's a conversation about adding beds. Um, but we also do have a lot of initiatives that this legislative uh, group has been a part of in the last couple of years um, outside of beds. And so I want to reflect back on Monica's comment. It's both and. Um, so when I look up and I see someone to prevent, we've done extensive training across our system with trauma and resiliency. We continue to do our suicide prevention work um, and then our community investments, such as our Vermont Child Psychiatry Access Program, which you all had a um, presentation on. Uh, but for those folks not familiar with that program, it provides access to psychiatry consult services for uh, individuals or primary care offices throughout the system. That's something that's currently grant funded, which a lot of these things are grant funded. Um, and so you don't see budget asks for them um, because we currently have federal dollars to, um, to engage in those uh, programs. Anything you want to add uh, related to someone to prevent? I think a lot of the other community-based services can be that. So the school-based mental health work that happens, the earlier upstream work, the early child and family um, mental health uh, and systems work that, that is occurring both with families, with young children, but also in child care centers. Um, all of that is kind of the earlier uh, upstream intervention. Um, and then we've had a lot of opportunity to talk about the 988 suicide and crisis um, lines, which is not diagnost diagnostic specific. Anyone who is having a self-defined crisis is able to call 988 um, and have that call be answered um, almost 90% of the time by somebody here in Vermont. Um, and we know how valuable that is for our communities. Um, that is also grant funded. So um, just making sure that folks are aware of that. Um, and then we also continue to operate um, our crisis text line and our pathways warm line, which is another opportunity for uh, persons with lived experience to utilize uh, a separate uh, warm line uh, should they feel uh, that that is um, more their style or they would benefit um, more from. And then we've also uh, engaged in our mobile crisis response or our enhanced mobile crisis response that goes across the age span. This um, house healthcare has been instrumental in um, our enhanced mobile crisis response program. That's a co-occurring program. And so um, that two person team can respond to a, a substance use issue, a mental health issue, um, and is compromised or com composed, compromised, composed <laughs> mm -hmm. of um, somebody with a lived experience and mm -hmm. um, a mental health clinician. Um, and then finally, there are somewhere to go. Uh, so we currently have um, a unit at uh, the Brattleboro Retreat that serves um, adolescents. Uh, they also have a unit that serves um, kids who are younger than 12. Uh, we have um, engaged with uh, Southwestern Vermont Medical Center uh, to uh, build adolescent capacity, inpatient capacity there. Um, we did that as we saw the capacity needs grow for inpatient level of care, as well as diversifying um, from the Brattleboro retreat um, and having um, a more integrated system for youth who need inpatient care. And when I say integrated, I mean an inpatient unit that is located uh, within a medical hospital. 
We've also engaged with our psychiatric urgent care, which is also somewhere to go. Pre-emergency um, emer room allows folks to get um, seen, um, brief interventions um, up to 23 hours a day. Um, our children's residential system, um, which is also known as our PNMI system. For this group, you have seen budget requests related to the PNMI system, um, and that is a lower level of care than a PRTF. Um, and then the micro residentials as well as somewhere to go. Uh, so I wanted to highlight these as the conversation has uh, really focused on whether or not the, the dollars that could be spent on a PRTF could be best served somewhere else. I mean, I'll go back to Monica Ogilvie's comments about both and, yes and. Um, that is accurate. We're spending dollars as it is, sending folks to Florida. And when we talk about transportation to Brattleboro, if it were me, I would much rather make a trip to Brattleboro than I would to Florida, I guess, for a variety of reasons. Um, so that, those have really stuck out to me as really important things to digest and consider as we think about uh, supporting youth um, in our communities, um, which we're proud to, to do in Vermont um, in a way that um, helps them become more um, healthier individuals, their families become more healthy, um, and um, hopefully aren't relying on the highest levels of care once they become adults and so on. So, anything to add from your lens? Not for this, but I heard questions related to um, kind of more of the utilization review process. Oh, okay. and I'm glad to talk about that um, if this is the time or, or after. I'm done. Okay. Um, so I know there are questions about both determining who are the kids and that medical necessity phase. I think that was addressed about the case review committee. Um, technically, it's it's each department hat holds the delegated Medicaid authority from DIVA to make that medical necessity determination. So it's each department, but based on the discussion and recommendations within the case review committee. I also want to note that case review has those uh, AHS and AOE representatives, but also has a um, Vermont Family Network family voice representative in there. Um, so we try to bring in to make sure we have that lens and perspective. Um, so there are representatives from each of our departments. They have different titles, like for DMH, it's our care managers um, who are in there. Um, for DCF, it's a um, residential coordinator. I might get their titles wrong, I apologize. Um, and for developmental disability services, it's their children's specialist. Um, but they all have a care management type of role in our different departments. And so we are reviewing um, clinical information, educational information, um, placement history of those youth, uh, trying to understand and talk about them. the team that has been working with that youth and family in their communities. They've gone through a coordinated service planning process um, to make that recommendation for a higher level of care. And then that medical necessity determination is made. Um, the CRC approves what type of setting and programming um, could best meet their needs because we don't want to compete for beds. Um, we want to think about all of Vermont youth um, and triage uh, youth together. Um, and then once, and then a referral uh, needs to be made to the programs that have been approved. And so that is the responsibility of the local team. And so our state representatives work with those local teams to make those referrals to little additional steps. When it's an out-of-state program, we have to comply with the Interstate Compact for Children to make sure that that state accepts that we're sending a child there and we still have responsibility for them. So there's just some additional process that needs to happen with that. Once the program, uh, they often do an interview with the child, there's additional process on their end. And then if they accept it, there might still be a wait until there's an opening of a bed. And that's dependent on someone within their program being ready to discharge which we know is dependent on whatever their community programming can be put together in that timeline. So the time between um, having that referral to CRC, getting that approval, that can be fairly short, but then the, the process of making the referral to the program, having them review and make a decision, and then having that opening actually occur can take months. Um, we try not to have it take that long, but that is sometimes the reality. And so there is a need for that youth to be held by a, a treatment team somewhere in the interim. 
Um, and there are many conversations that occur with families, with treatment providers about what is the least restrictive setting where we can support this youth in that interim phase. And that's really individualized for each um, youth. And of course, the question of do we have whatever is needed um, available? Once the youth has been admitted into that PRTF program out of state, those state representatives, the care manager type roles, continue to oversee um, their stay there. And so they're participating along with their um, local designated agency in treatment team meetings that occur uh, for that child when they're in that placement to understand what is the treatment that's happening? What are some of the concerns or issues that have come up? How is progress being made? Are we meeting the goals for that level of care? We don't see these um, admissions into residential programs as meeting all of the needs of a child. We have a, some treatment um, goals that we're trying to attain, and then we want to get them back into their community to continue the work because we know that that's not, it's just a piece in the, the continuum of, of their services. So that utilization review process is happening for those youth by our state representatives, but also we want to make sure that the local providers are involved as much as possible. It might be a local DCF social worker, um, or it's a designated agency if they've been involved with that youth before, whether it's the development of disabilities, part of that designated agency, or the mental health. And in many cases, it's both um, of those uh, development and mental health folks. And that will help with preparing for what is the transition plan for that youth. Are we looking at needing to find a developmental home? Are we looking to need to apply for a developmental services waiver and getting that process going? Are there uh, needs for a different foster home or do we wanna get a referral into a micro-residential program for them to step back into the community and start attending public school supports? So those are all of the um, conversations that are happening. Um, and within that, what's happening with the family and the family work that's occurring by the um, residential program? Um, what supports does that family need for them to also be prepared to have that youth coming back to the community? So that we don't wanna just be treating the youth. Um, it is very much a, a family system approach. Um, so it, I, I, I know those are some of the concerns. Within those conversations uh, arise families expressing concerns about this treatment approach doesn't seem to be working. Can we try something else? We might bring in OT or what else can we um, tap into from the community? When a youth is placed out of state and has Vermont Medicaid, um, that out of state program enrolls in Vermont Medicaid. So that has to happen before we have them admitted so that we they can bill Medicaid. If that youth is in Florida or Pennsylvania or even Cape Cod, um, there are I don't know if there's a PRT up there, but there are some residential programs. Um, <laughs> and they have dental needs, or they need to go for an annual physical, or they get injured and need to have um, care, you know, physical care. It is harder to make sure that those providers are also enrolled in Vermont Medicaid. Even if, um, I, I should add to that, uh, prescription medications and where are they getting this from? We work really closely with um, DIVA and their provider engagement folks to have them reach out to say, are you willing to become a, a Vermont Medicaid enrolled provider? But there have been times where um, people haven't been willing to, and then we have to figure out, especially if you've had chronic conditions that need regular care, getting them back to Vermont to see the provider here. And that is an added expense and time uh, and travel for that youth as well. So that's just, I wanted to add to that picture of the benefit of having someone remain in Vermont for this level of care. Okay, thank you for that. Is that everything? Okay, so we're gonna open it up to questions. And so we'll just pop it up for you two. I know, um, we can do Daisy first, if you still have a question. No, I'm good. Okay, Alyssa and then Topper. I don't know if this is for, anyone in the room, probably AHS more than anything. So, you know, we've had references to Brandon um, in this conversation and the chair of human services, you know, talked about some of her biases and we talked about seclusion and restraint. And I'm thinking about Woodside. How is this, how's this different than Woodside? What did we learn? from our other experiences, because I think we've learned that we go into the best intentions with things and sometimes they don't always work out the way we hope in the end. So are we, are we thinking about that sort of thing? What are we doing to put things in place? I mean, it, it seems like it's being housed in AHS, but 
every each individual agency has a little piece of it, but not enough of a piece of it to be held responsible for it. So I, I, I guess I'm putting it out there of uh, how are, how are we going to do better with can, this? Can I ask a clarifying question? Yes. What does responsible for it look like? Um, well, I think, I think that if you look at ultimately what happened with Woodside, it became sort of a hands off, which then allowed maybe some things to happen where youth were not receiving the care that they were supposed to be receiving. And so there wasn't oversight and accountability. I, so I, yeah. I guess well, I that's think the what oversight I mean. and the care was in the it, same ballpark, was in the same. So I see Shayla came in. Who? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who would like to answer this question? Well, I'll take a stab and Shayla can ground me if it's too out there, which she's good at doing. Um, one, I would say that I wasn't at Woodside, um, but I do know that there are a few folks in this room and within our all of our departments who did um, work at Woodside. And I, as a state, we are 100% um, committed to not repeating the past. And so you see Dale, DCF, DMH, AHS here today, because we're committed to kids being served well and being served when and where they need it. Um, and so without going in and rehashing all of, of um, what we've read or heard about Woodside, I can tell you that from my work, we're committed to not holding kids against their will uh, longer than necessary. And that's why we've engaged in conversations and contracts around six core strategies, because uh, that speaks um, that's a modality that can support that work. Um, and that's why you have uh, Deputy Radke here to talk about how challenging it is to keep kids and staff safe. But nobody wants to be putting kids locked away in a room somewhere. Uh, and I think that's the feeling. I don't know if that's the fact, but I know that's the feeling. Um, and so that's my initial response. And, and Shayla can uh, correct me. Um, and Monica Ogilvy gave her phone number earlier. So I guess <laughs> some, she's, <laughs> she ultimately, she's responsible. You good? Hello, everyone. Oh. Shayla Livingston, policy director for the Agency of Human Services. So thank you, Emily. I'm not going to correct anything you said. That's accurate. I do just want to draw your attention back, and you can look at the slide deck. I won't make... Let's look at it again. But that slide that had the three different departments and all their different levels of care, one of the things I think is really important about this level of care is how it fits into each of those departments flow. You heard a lot about system flow. Um, and it is very different than a secure facility for DCF uh, for individual children and, and juveniles who are justice involved. That's a different setting and a different type of care that is still needed in our system, but is definitely very separate from what we are talking about today. Um, a child might or youth might step down from that level of care to a PRTF setting in, in this system, right? That is the vision, but it is again, very separate and distinct from that type of care. Um, it is voluntary, it is overseen by CMS and regulated by the federal government and reimbursable by Medicaid. All of those things are not true for that secure level of care that, that you are thinking of. Thank you. The other, the other thing that I'll add. Right. It's up to you. If you could just say who you so, are. This is Monica Ogilvy, uh, Medicaid Director. The, the other thing that I'll add is we can't forget the past. We have learned a ton of lessons. It's important to honor that traumatic history. And it's equally important not to let those fears drive our decision making for the future because things have changed so much. And we shouldn't lose sight of the harm and trauma that can occur when children and youth aren't getting the right level of care. And so we are right now 
traumatizing and harming children and youth that are in the wrong level of care. So we're still hurting kids, even though we don't mean to, and we have a solution and a pathway and an option in front of us with buy-in from hospitals and the agency and our designated agency and SSA colleagues. And that's pretty meaningful. That doesn't always happen. So um, I just, I would be remiss not to add the harm we're doing with this by not doing this. Okay. Uh, All right. Yep. Uh, Eric Grant, you get Commissioner of the Family Services Division. I know that we're talking about PRTS, but I'd be happy to come back and really talk about what we're doing as far as lessons learned from Woodside moving forward with our permanent facilities that if you would be interested. Okay, great. Because we have definitely taken seriously what went on and the harm that was caused. And, and we do have an interim week moving away from that. Great, thank you. All right, I know we have Topper, Daisy, Art, and Melanie, and Brian. And then we have to move on. For those here for 3.15, we're gonna be late, sorry. Okay, Go I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be quick, I hope. Um, somebody, I, I think it was the first group that was up here, um, talked about the kind of people individuals that would be in this facility. And I, I think I heard you say it would be a mix of people. Some of them would be, I'm going to say, developmentally disabled with, with a caveat on intellectually disabled. And some would be just as involved. Um, am I right in, in that mixture? I think the mix is going to be very fluid. You're right in that there's no prescribed mix okay. and that there's going to be a lot of intentionality in thinking about that mix of youth that are there at the same time. Okay. Um, I'm, just, I'm, I'm not going to give you advice or anything. I'm just going to make a statement. Take a look at the statistics of mixing justice involved youth with people who are dis developmentally disabled. You might, you might want to think twice about that. So that's one thing I wanted to say. Um, since I can't talk about uh, the training school, because uh, my understanding is in 1993 is when Brandon Training School closed. So the kids, with the youth we're talking about now, even the ones that are 18 or 21, they would have to be 31 years old for me to talk about. Them. So I'm going to talk about the 18 to 21 year old. Um, we mentioned, I, I, first of all, I'd like to have the agency say, to answer this question, is, is one of your goals or your mission to keep families together as much as you possibly can when you're dealing with kids? Absolutely. It is. I, I thought it was. Always. Yeah. And that's why I asked the question about um, why can't you provide the services in a home? So I'm going to ask that question again. If I could speak to that. Yeah. Um, just because uh, Laura will land. Um, you can't hear me? Can you speak up? No, she's going to answer. If I could speak to that. Yep. Um, I, I think families would very much like to be supported to have their child at home, but not at the moment that we're talking about. They are exhausted, scared, really distressed. And I think they're seeking the right type of stabilization for their youth so they can come back home. Um, I think these are these are really hard conversations that are happening with the families about their child um, with teams. And I think if um, with that stabilization, families want to be able to support their kids coming home. They, they want their child to be getting the right type of care. Um, and they know that sometimes this out of home uh, admission into a more intensive treatment program is the step that's needed to then get back to that next phase. I think um, when we hear from families, when we hear from some of our um, advocacy groups, there is concern about the, the level of safety risk that families are trying to hold within their homes that they're not comfortable with. And that's sometimes why we have a child 
who might still be inpatient because as um, Tyler said earlier, families aren't feeling comfortable to go pick them up. It's around that safety concern. And I, I agree with you 100%. So let's move to the next step. Those kids, those youth, I'm talking about the 18 to 21 now, those youth stabilize. And then they're, they're sent somewhere. Let's say they're sent home. And those families need help with them. How come that's not happening? And I look to our partners at for the age. Ask anybody in the room. We know that it's not happening for everyone. Like, I guess there's everyone. Two that's right. That we're missing. Some people, I think, probably are being served. They are. Yeah. Okay. I know they are. And so I guess when you say, how come it's not happening? For it everybody. Happening. Okay. It's just not for everybody. Go ahead. Good. Anyone can answer that. So I, can you just? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, for, okay. I'm Jennifer Gear, Media and Development. Yeah. And can you just speak up too, please? Yeah. Sorry. So I I would say that we we do find that we have 250 individuals under the age of 22 who are receiving home and community based services. The majority of those between 18 and 22. Um, so the, the very age group that you're talking about, Representative, um, so many of those have not been to a PRTF in right. development of disability services. So most of the people are, are getting home and community-based services. And for those who go to PRTF or residential um, service, like residential facility level of care, they come back to home and community-based services. In the, the DS um, service um, sector, we see this as, as really kind of the top of the, the service you know, field. It, it is really kind of the highest level of support, and it's used for stabilization and support to come back to community-based services. You'll, you'll notice on that slide that each system sees it, it kind of falling into a different level of of the high end of services, but we see it kind of at the top level because it really is about um, short term treatment, stabilization, and support to come back to community based services. So I do think that um, it is, you know, I would love to talk to you more if you have particular uh, examples that you'd like to um, have us follow up on. But generally, we do see people come back to community-based services, and it's about sort of that stabilization, stabilization piece to help the community providers um, be able to provide those services. Because as we've discussed, really what we're finding is that these individuals exceed the capacity of community partners. So they exceed the capacity. For a, for a period of time, and so yeah, they need yeah, this okay. higher level of support. I just need to get this out. Yeah. Okay. And, and I am so glad to hear that these um, 18 to 21-year-olds or up to 22-year-olds are receiving this service. I'm really glad to hear that. And I said before that we're doing a pretty good job for youth. And so I'm going to close now by just saying we need to do it for people that are 22 to 60 because you, we have a hell of a gap there. Yes. And those people are not being served the way they should be. So we got to do something about it. We got to do it quick. And These people are aging out. Yeah, happy to talk to you about that more, sir. Okay. Great. I forget who was next. Daisy. Um, I've spent um, four of my last 24 hours talking with two families who have aged out. They're um, mothers who are caring for adult children um, who have incredibly complex conditions. And so I have an appreciation for um, what Cheryl Wilcox showed us was years of work leading up to the conclusion that we need this facility. Um, and I commend all of the partners that have worked together to propose this. Um, I don't know if VDH or DSU was in the room. No. No, okay, that's notable to me. Um, and I'm curious why not. Um, I also am curious where we can find information around what sort of assessment was done between the partners as to, um, Laurel, you outlined a really nice picture of what a family goes through in terms of a process for 
ending up in a facility like this, which is the last place I would want my child to go or to need to go. And given what I said about how I've spent four really difficult hours in the last day, just listening to parents who have been dealing with this for their almost their children's almost entire lives, I can't imagine what it's like. Um, and we don't pay people who work in these facilities enough or people who do the HCB home and community-based services enough. That's why the parents are doing it. No one wants to do this work for $14 an hour. Um, so my concern, just to summarize, is that, you know, are we doing enough in the community to balance this? Like, I understand there is a need. There is a very narrow section of our state whose families absolutely need this service and we may need to offer it to them, maybe. But what assessment did DMH, DCF and Dale do when you looked at that global picture and said, okay, here's our referral process for how a DCF kid gets to these services. Here's our referral process for a DMH kid. Cause I know sometimes they weave together, right? And, and how did you say we need to first reduce the fact that we have 87 kids right now out of state because the first thing you need to do is reduce that number, right? And make sure that you're not doing something wrong at getting kids just through that bottleneck. So what was the front end assessment of reducing the number of kids that even need this? So I, I'm, I'm gonna, what I'm going to need to do is get all the questions on the table, and then I'm going to need to schedule time for us to come back to this mm -hmm. because there's a lot of mm -hmm. questions, and I want to make sure we're not rushing the answers and that we have time for follow-up. Mm -hmm. So if hopefully someone is grabbing these questions, Daisy, that was very good, and I want to hear more about that. I have one more question. It's short. Go for it. Um, will there be involuntary medication used in the facility? I don't know how CMS regulates um, involuntary meds at a PRTF level. Um, so we can follow up on that. Is that what you mean, like court ordered medication? Yeah, yeah. Um, we don't typically uh, right now pursue court ordered meds at a residential level of care. Um, so I don't anticipate that, but that's a rushed answer. And we can, um, I can get you the facts on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your work. Melanie? Um, so for later, when we come back, um, I am a parent that has had to navigate the system of inpatient for a teenager, and it is needed. It's also hard to know where to and how to advocate and to get supports. And so what I would like to understand is at the case review committee level is where do parents get support and how do they speak their truths and get help? And then at any time during that system, because it is your worst nightmare and it's your biggest responsibility and finding those res those resources are incredibly hard. So if we could just understand where that happens, that would be really helpful. And I don't know if the child, the office of child youth and family advocate has a role in this, but it just would be great to see that for parents and for families. Thank you. All right. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> my question goes more of a basic thing. We've heard <clears throat> just today myriad of circumstances, groups, uh, locations, and so forth. Is there a document or document somewhere that outlines what, what the various categories of needed care are, where the kids would go, what, what qualifies them for that, or where they go, so we can have some overall understanding of this whole thing? Because we've just heard tons of stuff here, mm -hmm. but putting it all in perspective as to what it all means and how it fits together, which I hope it does. Mm -hmm. If you tell me it doesn't, then that's a problem in itself, but see how it fits together so we know who goes where and why and what's needed to take care of it. Is there something? I think that we could create that. What I'll go back to is a comment that was made earlier around access to ICU when you need it. We as humans expect getting access to an intensive care unit when we are in a compromised medical situation mm -hmm. and we have access to that. What we are trying to do is afford that to children um, who are experiencing pretty significant mental health concerns. 
um, substance use. Right, right. And, and, I, also. right. And, and so what we want to do is have that group of folks also have access to levels of care that as if that is a human Right. No, I, I I get all that, but what is so that level? So, are you looking of, for what does that uh, level of what care? Are, what does the level of care mean? What is it? Who qualifies for just just so we can? So the I, medical necessities. So right. Well, how, what's the whole program look like mm -hmm. from from soup to nuts? What does yeah. it look like? Because we just hear, I hear broken pieces of it. I don't know enough about it to put it all together into one coalesced form. You want to? Mm -hmm. What is it called? A PF? Whatever the acronym was. PRTF. There we are. <laughs> uh, but, but who's in it? We, we've heard a bunch of people are in it, but I don't know what that means because yeah. I don't. I can't put the state. numbers to it. Right. So I think I think what's key to Art's question is there's still like this. Everyone's involved, yeah. and that's really hard to understand. So. Exactly. Take that away and try and figure out how to make that a little bit more clear for us would be helpful, Brian. Yeah, well, I just want to say I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate that you're you're like pooling the resources under AHS and not being siloed yeah. in this approach. That's like a great strength of this proposal. And um, um, something I'm curious about is like how we could track factors related to social determinants that lead to higher levels of care and like what, in addition to the psychiatric, mental health, like medical treatment, what kind of referrals to resources? I know DCF does a lot of this work with families all the time. Like, I, like I want to give you credit. How much you prevent problems when you get involved in a family in a family's life early and get them resources, and how that that can prevent custody. So I know the state's doing this work, but um, I think we could take it to the next level as we keep adding these components. Um, and then yeah, so that's the kind of the question is like maybe how can we do that? Um, and like you know, I was just thinking more about like what are the barriers for people getting services in the community. And it's all the things our committee knows about already, like job vacancies, lack of supporting supportive and trans, trans, transitional housing or housing in general, special needs. And I think one thing that this, um, one element that this proposal addresses is the stabilization piece, because when someone's not stable, they just keep bouncing around. And so like, we, we just need a good place for people to land sometimes and stabilize so the family can get on their feet and like have the right support in place to to manage, you know, to support their child. So I think this is a great piece. And it would be cool if we could learn a little more about what's leading people to the higher le levels of care. How can we use the higher level of care as an intervention, but then how can like you advise us to change other policies that might be beyond the jurisdiction of this committee, yeah. you know, around the social determinants. So and that's the question. I know yeah. there was a lot to it, but I just, I, I just want to thank you because I do think this is an important, now that I've heard the details, I think this is an important component. And I want to reiterate what Brian said. I, it is amazing and wonderful to see everyone in this room together and working together on this. And we, I hear in your testimony, um, the emotion around this situation. And I know you all are doing what you feel is the absolute best for the children of Vermont. And I appreciate that. And I'm sure the committee appreciates that. So we're not trying to stymie that. But because everyone's in the room together and we don't normally have this, we have a lot of questions. So um, hopefully that's understandable. My questions, which can come back, are more budget related. So I will just send them to Shayla. Um, and then uh, we'll coordinate with Shayla once you all can, um, you know, think about the questions we have for a proper time to come back, understanding that the budget's in appropriations and we'll want to move as quickly as possible. So, again, we appreciate everyone's time and, um, and the, your thoughtfulness and what you're trying to do for Kids of Vermont. So, thank you. Thank you. We are going to take a break until 3 40, do not be late.